Well, let me first thank Paul for this invitation. I'm really very pleased to be here. And I think that uh, uh, I hope that we will have so many informal discussions. So this is just a twist in astrophysics. Uh, but uh, I hope that we will go deep into this subject in our satellite discussions. I would like to call uh, your attention in this talk to uh, a number of gas dynamical processes that are accompanying the formation of massive black hole binaries when two galaxies are merging. And I really hope to convince you that uh, we might really have a very close link with, the, with high energy astrophysics uh, and what I hope the incoming astronomy that we can perform with gravitational waves. And we, if we combine both, then we really can learn about the cosmic evolution of galaxies. So two major fields are joined uh, to, uh, to really give insight into the way our galaxies has formed and evolved. Here is the outline of my talk. I will briefly review key observations on massive black holes, but I will take advantage of cold night presentation, so I will skip some or just sleep very fast. Then I will discuss briefly the link with cosmology uh, just to motivate the fact that it is quite important to understand how binary black holes form in galaxy mergers. Then I will talk about self-gravitating circumnuclear disks around binary black holes as the one we see from our uh, simulations. And I hope to have time to touch uh, an interesting issue which is uh, related to LISA events. So do we have really electromagnetic counterparts to such uh, 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 to during the uh, last year of in spiral of two LISA black holes? And then I will outline my open questions. In the high redshift universe, uh, black holes grow in mass mainly by accretion uh, Cole was mentioned in salt an argument, and we can also discuss this a little bit later on. They grew up, they grow uh, by accretion up to, say, a million to a billion solar masses. And we know that they are powering uh, the bright quasars uh, while uh, galaxies uh, are forming. Can I have a pointer? Or? Ah, OK. So here is the uh, star formation rate per unit megaparsec volume as a function of redshift and time that I'm taken from Bowen's uh, latest results on UV rest frame luminosity uh, surveys. And so uh, you can see that uh, the bulk of the stars in our universe were forming when the universe was, say, between 1 and 3 giga is old. And, and this is just uh, 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 coinciding with the peak of uh, the quasar evolution. So it means that there is some synchronous mechanism which is able to produce very massive black holes at the same time when the bulk of the stars are collapsing from gas clouds in pregalactic units. And then uh, we have instead the evidence that uh, in every bulge and uh, elliptical galaxy, uh, we have in the center a massive quiescent black hole, which is probably the relic of the earlier uh, quasar activity. And since uh, bulges and spheroids are uh, stellar systems which are mostly dominated by the dispersion velocity of the stars and not by rotation, there has been always the claim that uh, uh, these uh, type of galaxies are the end results of 
major mergers that has really shaken the stellar uh, content uh, uh, to make them round and mostly spherical. Uh, so, let me also mention this, well, I can slip through this slide, but I want just to make the point that since uh, we really see the massive black holes uh, in uh, the very massive elliptical galaxies, and we have some evidence uh, that uh, the less massive galaxies may host black holes in the range between 1,000 to 10,000, 100,000 solar masses, there has been the idea that if in uh, the low mass galaxies uh, black holes are able to grow from some mechanism and uh, uh, galaxies are participating to the assembly, then we can consider these as being the evidence that these light black holes could be just the seed upon which the very massive ones are growing uh, at very early epochs. Uh, a word on uh, intermediate mass black hole seeds, uh, as uh, Cole was already saying, we really don't have strong compelling evidence that nature is really producing black holes, say, of 10,000 solar masses or less. We have evidence uh, from the ultra-luminous X-ray sources that are seen in uh, uh, nearby galaxies. These are sources, uh, point-like point -like off-nuclear sources uh, emitting, say, 10 to the 40 ergs per second, so they are sort of mini uh, active galactic nuclei. And there has been the suggestion that uh, they might be intermediate mass black holes accreting for a massive donors, but we have also more conventional explanation as particular anisotropic and beaming state of ordinary high mass X-ray binaries. And we have also some claim that intermediate mass black holes are just at the center of some cluster, and G1, a globular cluster in Andromeda, may host just a 10,000 uh, 10, uh, solar mass black hole. But uh, the idea of IMBH seeds, in my view, is mainly theoretical and not observational. They could be also the end result of a relativistic unstable gas cloud, which is collapsing, forming a very big star, which then uh, becomes a black hole. And also in the literature, it has been also the, uh, explored the possibility that the first stars which were collapsing from clouds which were metal free could produce very massive stars mainly because in the absence of a metal content, uh, the stars, uh, which are massive, do not have strong winds and then can keep their mass until they end uh, as uh, massive black holes. But again, at uh, a theoretical uh, point, uh, uh, point of view, uh, it, it is still quite uncertain. But this might be uh, a way to produce these seeds. Uh, let me skip this. Well, and so uh, in a cosmological context, uh, we know that uh, galaxies are just uh, forming uh, and collapsing. The barriers are collapsing into uh, the dark matter halos. And so uh, the idea that has come out uh, uh, recently, and let me just uh, go to this picture here, if that uh, the big galaxies are just the end result of a sequence of a hierarchical mergers. And if every single low mass galaxy has been able to grow a black hole, say at redshift uh, 20 or 10, then during the hierarchical clustering of the structures, uh, black holes were 
approaching each other. So these seed black holes uh, in these pregalactic units uh, that are merging will also end up forming binary black holes that are then uh, coalescing, leaving a burst of gravitational waves. And so one of, as you know, of the major scientific objectives of LISA is just to uh, pick up the signal from these uh, uh, relatively low mass black holes which are coalescing in these pregalactic units. So we will not only measure using gravitational wave astronomy the masses and the spins of uh, these uh, uh, primordial sort of black holes, but also we can learn about galaxy formation in a cleanest way across the entire universe. So we could really, by l picking up the uh, gravitational, uh, the coalescence event, we could really prove how galaxies has indeed assembled. And uh, uh, if you just play uh, with Monte Carlo uh, uh, merger trees, uh, uh, as was done by Marta Volontari and by Cesana et al., one can estimate uh, the rate of black hole binary coalescence. Uh, this is clearly strongly model dependent, but it is the first attempt to uh, really uh, try to, to design uh, this assembly. And the outcome of these, res uh, the, these studies is the following. They are expecting 64 events per, years, per year involving LISA black hole, that is in the range between 1,000 up to 10 to the 5 solar masses. 57 events are uh, distributed over a cosmic time between 0 and 20, when redshift z uh, zeta is, tw z is 20, the universe is only 10 to the 8 years old. And uh, uh, these events are involving really very light black holes. And then uh, they are expecting seven events, again over the same redshift uh, range, involving uh, black holes having a mass between 0 0.1 and 10 million solar masses, with a peak in the uh, formation uh, uh, which is occurring at redshift 5. I'm very much interested in black holes having, say, a reference mass of a million solar masses because we have compelling evidence that in our galactic center we have a black hole of such mass. And so we decided to study in some greater detail the clustering and the merges of, of galaxies hosting uh, a million solar mass black hole just because, for sure, one is there in nature. Before moving to uh, the simulations, let me just uh, recall that if this scenario of binary uh, of clustering of galaxies and formation of binary black holes, it is true, we should look many uh, galaxies showing double activity. And uh, uh, here is just, uh, uh, I'm just reporting the very nice Chandra X-ray image of the ultra-luminous infrared galaxy NGC 64 6240, uh, in the hard X-rays, you can uh, really see two bright nuclei, so probably the activity of two relatively massive black holes, say, of uh, 100 million solar masses, which are active while the two galaxies are merging. And they are seen at a separation of 1.4 kilo parsec. So just before, uh, the two, uh, before the two galaxies will end up probably forming a rather spheroidal galaxy. Let me also mention a recent claim by Rodriguez that uh, uh, there are 
in this radio galaxy, which is nearby to us, there are two com compact radio flat variable double nuclei, which are instead separated uh, with a distance, of, with a projected distance of only seven parsecs. So here we have three order of magnitudes, and I will try to explain whether this fits with what we understand about galaxy merger. But clearly, as was also Cole saying, we don't see many, many double nuclei uh, in the universe, so it may tell us that probably the process is very short-lived. But also let me also mention that when we have a starburst, uh, we have a lot of dust around, and so perhaps even nuclear activity in a sense buried and it's very difficult to separate from the x-rays which are coming from supernova explosion from the hot interstellar medium which has been shocked during the merger event okay uh, so uh, when studying uh, the formation of binary black holes and binary quasars uh, we can do it uh, at a cosmolo in a cosmological context, uh, as Marta Volontari et al. did, by studying them at a statistical level, uh, just uh, to have an idea, as I've shown you, of how many events could, in principle, LISA see. The other approach instead, which is the one I've been taking, is just really to understand the dynamics uh, of the merger and how black holes indeed bind. The process is very complicated because uh, you can see immediately that you uh, have to deal with a wide dynamical range. Mergers, even at redshift, say, z equals 7, are occurring on scale of, say, 100 kiloparsec on say, cosmologically self-consistent plunging orbits. If you take a, a black hole reference mass of a million solar masses, you would like to uh, really see if the two black holes which are inside uh, the two galaxies are able to bind. And this is occur occurs at a distance, say, of 10, kilo, 10 parsec. So I have really to count how much mass I have in gas and star enclosed in their orbit. And once, uh, when the, the gas and stellar mass become comparable to the mass of the two black holes, then I start thinking that the two black holes are really forming a very close pair and eventually their orbit will become Keplerian. When I am addressing issues related on accretion, so on the X-ray uh, light that can come out, then I have to mainly know uh, the distribution of gas and stars within the black hole sphere of influence, uh, which is, say, one parsec, so it is still very small. But what is really challenging is that if I want to see the black hole in spiral and coalesce, driven by the gravitational wave back reaction, the two black holes has to reach separations which are around a milliparsec, and this separation is also depending sensitively on the eccentricity. So one issue is, in a merger, do the black hole bind into very circular or very eccentric orbit? And what is the evolution of the eccentricity along their uh, slow in spiral, which is driven first by gas dynamical and stellar processes, and only at the very end by gravitational waves. So given the, the difficulty, um, there has mainly in, be in literature two 
uh, big streams of studies. One could just uh, study closed black hole pairs embedded in a given predetermined background, imagining or already what would be the end result of a merger. And so in a stationary uh, background, just to study the subsequent evolution. And this can be done in pure stellar backgrounds. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, Spurzen and others will really be talking about this in very great detail. Uh, the main process which is driving the two black holes very close is dynamical friction against the stellar background initially, and then the ejection of stars by free body encounters, which are extracting the gravitational binding energy, allowing the two black holes to come close. The other approach is to consider that you have two black hole pairs which are in a, inside a background which is uh, dominated by the gaseous component, in particularly in sort of cell gravitating nuclear disk, and I will be showing some result soon. Remember that at very high redshifts, most of the gas, of the baryons uh, in the pregalactic structures were in gas. So probably the gas dynamical, uh, the gas dyna the, 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 the dynamical clustering of black holes has occurred preferentially in gaseous background uh, this instead of stellar ones. The other alternative is just to deal with mergers. You have only the difficulty that uh, you have to cover more than eight order of magnitudes in uh, uh, resolution, force resolution, in order to have a meaningful result. Uh, one can do it using idealized mergers, like uh, take two spherical galaxies uh, hosting a central black hole, and then do the dynamics, see probably that the remnant uh, is a non-axisymmetric uh, uh, galaxy, and then study in detail, as was done by Merritt Group, again, the, uh, 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 the, the, the spiraling of the black holes. Or, and this is slightly more difficult, is just to try to, mean to uh, take a real model of a galaxy that is with its dark matter halo, stars uh, in a disk, gas in a disk, and a bulge, and try to see whether you uh, will really form a Keplerian binary. And this is uh, uh, what uh, we are now doing in collaboration, I'm doing in collaboration with Lucio Meyer at ETH uh, in Zurich, uh, Stelios Kazantzidis at Kevli in Stanford, and in Milano also with Massimo Dotti. We decided to study galaxy, gas-rich galaxy mergers because we would like to address a number uh, of questions. Do binary black holes form naturally in a gas-rich environment? Do they bind into a Keplerian binary or just remain a loose pair? How does the process depend on the thermodynamics of the gas? This is a crucial point. Are there differences between major and minor mergers? When I say major merger means that I combine two galaxies having comparable masses and probably comparable mass uh, ma uh, and, and two black holes of comparable masses, but the bulk of the merger, especially at very high redshifts, are involving galaxies with mass ratio, say, 0 0.1 or even less. And also, you would imagine that their corresponding black holes. Then, are there really differences between collisionless and gas-rich mergers? Uh, this is a very interesting point, because uh, 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 the very 
massive elliptical galaxies show in their stellar distribution profile a core. And Merritt had a very nice suggestion that the core is produced by the ejection of stars that has also promoted the coalescence of the two massive black holes down to the gravitational wave domain. So perhaps we also learn a lot about the dynamics of the galaxy and black hole clustering by looking and studying in very much detail the stellar profile. So it is important to understand how this process can affect the shape of the remnant. Then the second question is, once the two black holes I will show really come close together, how do they rapidly coalesce in 10 million years during the merger or in a longer or perhaps in a shorter time? This is a discussion I would like to start. When the merger is completed and the galaxy is already in its new equilibrium state, this matters also when we uh, uh, study the electromagnetic counterparts because if a galaxy, if the two black holes are coalescing in a very short time scale and I see a LISA event, then I go into the sky and see what is the optical or the X-ray counterpart. Should I look for a, a, a starburst galaxy or instead should I look at a very uh, elliptical and uh, gas poor elliptical. This is depend in some way on a timing uh, and, and uh, the rapidity at which uh, uh, this occurs. So, um, so we decided uh, to uh, model the merger of two Milky Way like galaxies with a halo disk bulge. Uh, we have a disk which is made of uh, ten percent of the disk mass is made of gas, not really much, but because you can imagine that at very high redshift, fifty percent or even more of the disk were mostly uh, in, uh, gauge, in a gaseous component, but we are limited by, uh, by the numerics. We use more than a million particles in dark matter and stars and 10 to the 5 SPH particles in, in, a, in, the, in our first simulation. And also we can treat the gas and in particular the, the energy equation including shock and compressional heating, net radiative cooling by a cosmological abundance of atomic and helium uh, 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 composition with a floor temperature that allows you also allow us to, to uh, treat star formation. So let me just uh, uh, show a classical, a sort of uh, classical uh, pathway for a merger. This is quite similar also to the one that Cole has shown coming from uh, Springle and Di Matteo. Uh, studies which are using mainly the same force resolution as we are. And here I'm just plotting only the gaseous component, but you, can, you should imagine that these disks are embedded in their uh, dark matter halos and mainly is dynamical friction against the dark matter which is driving the evolution until uh, the two disks uh, are touching and then uh, uh, strong tidal deformations and tidal torques are really uh, dragging the black holes uh, in the center of the remnant. Here is just a, a picture, but I skip it. Uh, let me just tell you that when we do our simulation, uh, uh, we find mainly uh, we can uh, sort of find two main uh, interesting outcomes. The first, that before the merger is completed, we see that the two black holes which are dragged inside their disks uh, happen to be surrounded by uh, two disks uh, that are the results of uh, tidal talks. Uh, these two disks uh, have uh, a mass of uh, 100 million 
solar masses. And the projected uh, separation of uh, these two uh, nuclear disks, uh, uh, which are uh, probably uh, feeding the two black holes, is quite really similar to uh, the separation we see for NGC 6240. So we are really tempted to make this association. We cannot solve at this time the sphere of influence of the black hole to know what is the accretion rate, because then I would immediately get the luminosity and say, haha, this is really compatible with the observations. We cannot do it right now. But also let me tell you that at this very time, we have the first starburst, which is triggered. So probably we are catching some relevant physics, uh, because I cannot enter in detail, but these simulations have clearly some crude approximations in the way we treat gas dynamics. The second time, uh, uh, and so, well, let me just return back and tell you that the time scale for uh, this to occur is around five giga years, okay. Then uh, we, uh, using a particle uh, splitting technique, we were able also to follow the, uh, um, the, the evolution of the gas down to uh, scales of around two parsecs. And let me just tell you that uh, here is uh, uh, the distribution of the gas in the remnant. We see the formation of a non axisymmetric gaseous turbulent disk, which is mainly supported by rotation. And in the first uh, 10 to the 5 years, uh, after uh, the major merger has been completed, we see very large radial inflows of gas, but then everything goes, in a sense, into quiescence. And so probably in this very moment, the two black holes, which are sitting inside, uh, had probably time to accrete and perhaps to uh, shine as two very uh, uh, bright, uh, but perhaps dust enshrouded AGN, the separation I will come in a moment. Okay, the nuclear disks that we produce are as massive as 10 to the 9 solar massive. So in the very last uh, uh, moment of um, the merger, uh, uh, again, uh, instabilities were able to drive a considerable amount of gas in this region. So there might be really the hope that the black holes are really growing in mass in this stage. What is the relative distance between the two black holes that for at the beginning were just passively uh, inside the bulge and the disk? And then now they mainly behave as isolated objects because now we are in, in the formed remnant galaxy. So let me just tell you that if we play with the thermodynamics of the gas and we treat the gas with an equation of state which we believe is suitable in a starburst environment, let me just tell you that a starburst environment have some ghoul gas and dissipation, then we see that the two black holes are really uh, approaching our mainly uh, force resolution limit of one parsec, and they form a Keplerian binary. But if by hand we make the gas warmer, so mainly we quench cooling and the gas is behaving nearly adiabatically, the gas dynamical processes are not efficient enough over a time scale of only, you can see here is 5.12, 5.1222, only on a scale of a few million years over a time scale of a giga year, which is the time scale of the merger, uh, these two black holes are still uh, hanging around at a distance of 100 parsec. So we cannot still be sure that we can predict, look, the dynamics of the black holes in merging galaxies is such that either they just 
uh, they just approach very, very close distances to be uh, similar to the radio galaxy that we see, so the two very compact radio core, or instead they are hanging around at a much wider distance. Certainly stars will clearly play a role. Here we don't have the resolution such that to have dynamical friction against the stars, but certainly also stars will be produced in the circumnuclear disk. We don't have the recipe, yes, embedded, but certainly stars also will play a role. And perhaps in, say, one in 10 to the 7 uh, years, uh, or even less, uh, okay, the two, uh, the two black holes uh, will uh, really uh, reach very close separations. So the message is that uh, the ability to uh, form very uh, close binary black holes is quite sensitive to the gas dynamics. And also, we have to keep in mind that stars can pay, play, even in a gaseous environment, play a very crucial role. But can we reach the domain uh, where gravitational waves uh, become important? In my simulation, I have a force resolution of one parsec. Can I prove that in this merger, I have the coalescence of the two black holes in a Hubble time, or even less. So we decided to uh, model the remnant nuclear disk uh, uh, with a, a mestel disk, with, which is a sort of isothermal, uh, is, is the equivalent of the isothermal sphere for the disks. And uh, we could really, and we took uh, the two black holes along two circular orbits, uh, and we could really see that they were dragged by uh, dynamical friction uh, against the gaseous background down to, at least now we reach a resolution of 0 0.5, uh, 0.1 parsec. But we are still on our way to uh, study accretion in much greater detail. What we have shown that, uh, so the, the, let me just say that the main mechanism that is uh, extracting orbital angular momentum is due to the uh, density enhancement that the two black holes are, created, uh, are creating in this gaseous environment. So a density wake which is dragging behind. At some point, uh, the two wakes uh, are mainly interfering each other. And you can produce an ellipsoidal deformation so the binary separation is misaligned with the overall gas distribution. And this is an effect that can further drive the two black holes toward the submilliparsec scale. Uh, let me just uh, show, uh, address now in five minutes uh, the issue on the eccentricity. So I told you, I forgot telling you that in our galaxy merger, the two black holes were approaching each other into a Keplerian uh, binary along a mildly eccentric orbit, co-rotating with the nuclear disk, which is self-gravitating, and I repeat, co-rotating. So uh, the question is, uh, what is the eccentricity evolution in a gaseous background which is corrotated? It's not in hydrostatic equilibrium. And uh, what we find is that if I take a black hole, so consider this black hole, and I follow his orbit uh, inside this disk, at the beginning is creating the overdensity by dynamical friction, which is uh, decelerating the black hole. This overdensity is behind the black hole. But when the black hole is at the upper uh, center, the relative velocity uh, between the black hole and the co-rotating disk decreases because uh, uh, the black hole is uh, moving slowlier. And instead, the uh, wake is dragging behind. And this is the reason why we see circularization. So the message is that 
if in a merger which is dominated by uh, the dynamics of the gas, uh, the two black holes bind on an eccentric orbit, well, the orbit will likely to circularize. And also we are now proving that if, and if I have a, a rotating stellar background, we have this very same effect. It's only gravity which is involved. And this is really uh, what matters. But still, we have to work a lot in the, what I call the transition uh, between the dynamics of the black hole in a self-rotating and self-gravitating rotationally supported disk as the one which I get for granted in my uh, SPH uh, and N-body simulation, and what we can call the accretion disk, where the two black holes are mainly dominating also the uh, motion of the gas itself. And uh, two minutes, I will briefly uh, try to sketch uh, the ideas that are now uh, studying. Well, it is likely, particularly when the mass ratio between the two black holes is much less than one, it is likely that one black hole, the most massive, is sitting at the center and is surrounded by a gaseous disk. The other black hole is just orbiting in the inner orbit of the outer circumbinary disk, which is still a sort of uh, Shakura Sunyaev disk, in a sense. But uh, the interaction of uh, the black hole with this disk is creating a gap, as it is seen in the study of uh, planet formation around uh, stars. Mainly, uh, the, 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 the low mass black hole is creating a wake, uh, which is uh, uh, depositing angular momentum, so the gas is prevented to accrete, and uh, you might uh, reach a sort of equilibrium situation in which you have that uh, the rate at which angular momentum is given by the black hole to the gas is balanced by the uh, viscous torque, uh, which is instead trying to uh, uh, drag uh, the gas and let it accrete. Okay, so according to very nice work by Hermitage and Natarajan, uh, okay, so, uh, well, let me just uh, make another point. If, suppose we are now uh, uh, ready to see the, in the process of seeing a coalescence in the last year of Inspiral, Lisa in the best cases, we'll see the last year of in spiral of two coalescing black holes. We could see a preglow if uh, there is uh, a disk that has survived uh, for a time, say, is comparable to the time of the, the merging of the two black holes, say, 10 uh, million years. We might see a preglow because mainly the, the disk can probably still accrete uh, onto the massive black hole. Instead, when coalescence is completed or almost done, it was pointed out by Milos and Stolfine, we have this circumnuclear disk that at some point will accrete thanks to viscous torques, and we could then see a, 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 a galaxy which is turning on. Because the message I have is that we could see the electromagnetic signal coming from a LISA event if we see only an on-off or off-on source, because otherwise in our sky we would be plenty of quasars, plenty of uh, starburst galaxies, and so we cannot really decide where to point. Okay. Uh, with Albert, with uh, Cezana, we have, uh, and I stop here, uh, with Cezana we have computed how many uh, afterglows Constellation X or Xeus could see simultaneously to a LISA event, and uh, uh, we have a good news. Uh, in five years of operations, we could see this on-off state given all the limits uh, in flux uh, by Xeus of co uh, constellation. And so uh, perhaps this will be the discussion for the, for the satellite sections, and I stop here with the questions that are uh, left.
to the discussion. Thank you. Perhaps uh, uh, it probably is going to help in uh, promoting the, uh, the, the coalescence. Well, Escala has done some, has played around and uh, has produced a more clumpy uh, disk. And we have seen that uh, uh, the, the, the orbital evolution, the dynamics of the black hole is clearly more random, and this could really help. It could be possible, but it depends really. We, we, we should discuss, okay. Cole is next. Yes. I think that it would be absolutely great to include a stellar formation in these waves. And uh, Escala is already doing something. And, uh, and to see then really w what happens, because also you may have also formation of intermediate or star cluster that can, can really, uh, to have a sort of self-consistent picture in this very complicated moments where the dynamics play a role at all level, starburst dynamics of the two black holes, that would be absolutely great. And I'm sure that certainly stars are still keeping a role which is ne necessarily neglected in my simulations. Okay, way in the back and please speak up. Yes, let yes, I agree fully with you, and uh, probably I was uh, not very clear. The circularization that I see in this gaseous disk occurs when the two black holes are not still bound. So the message is that I want to give that in, in, in such backgrounds, I can prepare the two black holes on, on circular, nearly circular bound orbits but then the evolution from, say, crudely speaking, 10 parsec down to a milliparsec can really change again the evolution of the eccentricity because of the effect that you are telling. Clumpiness, stars, uh, uh, how stars are distributed, stellar profile, and this is just uh, uh, not the one, the, the thing I was saying. This is just circularization in this very early phase, uh, in case the two black holes are coming down uh, onto nearly eccentric orbits. One last quick question. I think John had one. The X-ray luminosity? Yes. Are you tell? No. I. Uh, are you referring to uh, this? Yeah. This. No. This. Uh, uh, we have taken the model by Sterfini and Milos Milosevic, and so we were able to uh, uh, know how much time it takes for the circumbinary disk to accrete. And uh, Milos is giving a scale I've written somewhere here. Uh, so the, the smaller is the mass of the black hole, here it is, 
the shorter is the time it takes uh, for the, uh, the disk to reach uh, the final stable orbit and accrete. Then I just uh, say that uh, the, two, the, the, the coalesced black hole is accreting at the Eddington rate. This is an assumption. And then I just uh, uh, put the source uh, uh, at different redshifts and just count the flux. But then I use the statistics of the merger trees in order to know how many events I had. And I get them all in five years. So we're not, you're not actually using the orbital motion? That you no, 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 no. This is already at coalescence. The coalescence is done. In uh, ten years from, uh, in five years of operation after the LISA event, I see an off-on source on the sky, and I say, Perhaps this is the optical counterpart of ELISA event. Okay, I think that should be it for now. We have maybe just uh, 15 minutes for the coffee break, but because of the lunch uh, hurdle, let's try to be back a couple of minutes early, okay? And let's thank Monica one more time. Thank you.